The NTSB preliminary report is out on United Airlines Flight 2477, which departed the end of runway 27 at Houston's George Bush Intercontinental Airport back on 8 March, and serves as a precautionary tale about procedural intentional non-compliance of standard operating procedures. There was nothing wrong with this Boeing 737-800 aircraft that could have caused this accident. And by the way, we now know why the left main landing gear failed on this incident. You see this irrigation box located right here? Well, there's another one located just off screen to the right here that the left main landing gear penetrated, snapping the left main gear off. It's Tuesday, the 9th of April. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. Let's check it out. First, let's take a look at the flight crew, a very experienced flight crew. The captain, 61 years old, ATP, rated it in a bunch of different Boeing aircraft. Current medical, got hired way back in 1987, had over 15,000 hours in the 737, very comfortable in the aircraft, 9,600 hours as pilot in command. The FO-38 years old ATP, got on with United in 2019 and had over 1,200 hours in the 737. So very experienced and familiar crew with the Boeing 737. Weather at the time of the accident was light winds out of the south at five knots. Visibility one and a half miles in mist with a broken ceiling at 800 feet and overcast at 1,800 feet. A temperature dew point spread of only about one degree Celsius, 23 and 22. Surface visibility reported at two and a half miles and photo and surveillance video during and immediately following the accident indicated wet runway and taxiway surface conditions. Here's the IAH airport in Houston. Here's runway 27, nearly 10,000 feet long. This accident occurred right here as the aircraft was clearing the end of the runway and the aircraft slid off the end and ended up right here. The pilot was attempting to expedite his time on the runway to clear the runway quickly here at the end to line him up with the gates here for United Airlines located right off the end of the runway. There was also traffic landing right behind United which prompted ATC to urge United to expedite clearing the runway. On March 8th, 2024, at about 0758 Central Standard Time, United Airlines Flight 2477, a Boeing 737-800, November 27290, experienced a runway in excursion, not incursion, but excursion, while exiting runway 27 onto taxiway Sierra Charlie at the IAH airport. That's at the very end of the runway. The left main landing gear departed the paved surface and con a concrete structure that was recessed into the ground resulting in its separation. The six crew and 160 passengers were deplaned via air stairs. No injuries reported. Of course, it's a FAR Part 121 airliner flight and everybody's getting involved in the response here, including NTSB, FAA, the Boeing Company and ALPA, the Airline Pilots Association and their associated unions. And the NTSB is looking at all the different factors, including the data from the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. History of the flight. According to the flight crew, the captain was the pilot flying and the first officer was the pilot monitoring. Remember, there's a captain and a co-pilot on each flight and it's assigned that way through the entire sequence. However, the pilots flying generally swap each leg. So oftentimes it's the captain flying and the pilot monitor, co-pilot monitoring. Then the next leg, it'll be the co-pilot flying and the captain plays the role of the pilot monitoring. The captain said he observed the reported runway surface codes when checking the uh, ATIS automatic weather via his electronic flight bag, his EFB, his um, iPad for runway 26 left and 26 right. He recalled seeing codes 333 for runway 27, codes of 555. RCAM, or Runway Condition Assessment Matrix, is the science of reporting the friction on runways around the world. These numbers are given in threes and divide the runway up into three sections, the touchdown portion of the runway, the midpoint, and the rollout section of the runway. As different portions of the runway may have different levels of friction or lack of friction. 
especially at the rollout end where there may be massive accumulations of rubber. On every landing, an airline pilot is required to do a runway assessment and determine his stopping distance for the runway he's landing on, unless the conditions are a very standard condition and the runway is of a certain size and it's dry. But anytime the runway is wet, you have to go through this procedure. And part of that procedure involves looking at this chart here where the RCAM code is described. So the lower the number is, the more slippery the runway is. For example, an RCR reading or an RCAM reading of five means braking deceleration is normal and the wheel braking effort applied and directional control is normal. Pilot reported braking action is good. If the RCR number is three, that means braking deceleration is noticeably reduced for the wheel braking effort applied and or directional control is noticeably reduced. Pilot reported braking action is medium. And this continues all the way down to an RCR of zero where it's just ice and you can't hardly stop at all. So it sounds like in the captain's initial interview with the NTSB that he got the RCR readings backwards for the two different runway options. For runway 26 left and 26 right, which he was first offered, he recalled seeing codes of 333 or a wet runway and for runway 27 codes of 555, a dry runway. The actual runway surface condition codes being broadcast on the ATIS for runway 27 at the time were 333, a wet runway which according to the runway condition assessment matrix RCAM indicated the runway was slippery when wet and braking deceleration is noticeably reduced for wheel braking effort applied and or directional control is noticeably reduced. When the crew checked in with Houston approach control, they were told to expect a landing on runway 26 left. The captain asked the FO to request a landing on runway 27 instead. I wonder what the FO said. So it may be that the captain chose runway 27 because he thought that runway was drier than the uh, runway 26 left. It may not have been just the fact that he wanted to get closer to the gates sooner. The FO made and the controller approved the request and issued instructions for the ILS for runway 27. After checking in with Houston Tower, about 12,000 feet MSL, according to the FO, the captain asked the FO to request approval to roll to the end of runway 27. This is what gets him more lined up with the gates. The FO made the request. A tower controller approved it and instructed them, you better keep your speed up. And that was first reported on our first report on this as we captured the live ATC data. And again, it was requested by ATC to keep your speed up because there was traffic landing behind United so he needed to clear the runway. The captain changed the auto brake setting from two to one, which would command a reduced deceleration rate. Okay, now I'm get, beginning to get the picture here. If it's a wet runway, you always set the auto brakes to three, just automatically. That's the standard operating procedure. But if he is thinking that the runway is dry by mistake, yeah, he could reduce that auto brake setting. Remember, auto brakes, the higher the number, the higher deceleration rate, the auto brakes will automatically decelerate the aircraft at a predetermined rate of deceleration. The approach was conducted in IMC and instrument meter. He was in the goo, in the soup. And according to the crew, the airplane broke out about 800 to 1,000 feet MSL. They reported that the visibility under the clouds was good and the captain recalled that the runway appeared dry. The FO recalled that the runway appeared wet. The crew stated that the touchdown was uneventful at an appropriate speed and within the touchdown zone, the speed brakes extended normally and the thrust reversers were deployed to idle reverse thrust. The captain said that shortly after touchdown, he retracted the speed brakes by the action of moving the speed brake lever to its down and lock position, which disabled the auto brakes. You don't mess with the configuration of the aircraft while you're on the runway. You leave the speed brakes out and you'll see this every time you land, they'll automatically pop out those big barn doors on the top of the wing when they sense the weight on the wheels and they will stay out until you clear the runway and then you begin the doing the checklist of cleaning up the aircraft after landing and you stow those speed brakes after you've cleared the runway because they're vital to helping you get slowed down. They 
spoil the lift off of the wings and remove that lift and put the weight on the wheels so that the auto brakes can do their function. Now that he's deployed them or stowed them, uh, the auto brakes are now off. And that's another call out that's mandatory by the pilot monitoring is auto brakes off. And we'll have to see if that was done on the CVR, cockpit voice recorder. So the auto brakes went from whatever setting he had there, one or two to zero. So you're just relying on manual pilot braking, which still has anti-skid braking. So after touchdown, the captain retracted the speed brakes by moving the speed brake lever, which disabled the auto brakes. And he said he did not slow too much initially because the runway appeared dry and he wanted to expedite their time on the runway. And because he preferred decelerating gradually for passenger comfort. The captain said he applied the brakes manually using the tow brakes at about 6,000 feet from the end of the runway, but felt as if the deceleration was less than normal. Flight data from the aircraft and ADS-B data indicated that after the disabling of the auto brakes occurred, manual braking did not begin until the airplane was about 4,000 feet from the end of the runway. Perception versus reality after one of these incidents. <laughs> the captain recalled hearing the runway awareness advisory system alerting 1,000 feet of runway distance remaining. This is some great new technology that's been put in aircraft in the last decade or so, or the RAS system, which will start yelling at you if you approach the end of the runway too quickly. And it'll start yelling at you, reminding you of how little amount of runway distance you have remaining. It knows the ground speed and how quick you're coming up to the end of the runway. He, I suppose the captain, became concerned and began applying more pressure to the brakes. As he approached the end of the runway, he elected to attempt to turn onto taxiway Sierra Charlie by utilizing the tiller, the steering tiller and rudder pedals while pushing aggressively on the brake pedals. Well, that's where that, that nose gear is just gonna break loose and um, understeer right into the dirt. During the turn onto the taxiway, he felt the fuselage and brake and rudder brake pedals begin to shake violently. <laughs> yeah. He briefly released the brake pressure and the shaking ceased. He then reapplied aggressive brake pressure and the shaking resumed. The aircraft slid off the runway and the left main landing gear and nose wheel wheels tires entered the grass before the aircraft came to a rest with its left wing low. That shuddering, that shaking is the nose wheel steering uh, skidding across the tarmac instead of tracking across the tarmac that nose wheel is located right behind you as an air crew member and you can really feel that shuddering a post-accident examination of the accident site revealed that the left main landing gear tires had imp impacted a large concrete manhole that's that irrigation box designed as an electrical junction box for lights and utilities at the airport as a result of the impact the left main landing gear separated from the aircraft at the fuse fuse pins or fuse pins near the rear spar as designed to prevent more severe damage to the surrounding structures. So the engineering worked on the aircraft. The airplane came to a rest on the left engine nacelle, left winglet, aft fuselage, and sub sustained substantial damage to the left wing and aft fuselage. So the data shows a touchdown at a normal point at a normal speed engine thrust reversers deployed to only idle thrust for a normal amount of time and stowed at about just above 60 knots. But the speed brakes were automatically deployed for a very short amount of time and then manually stowed pretty quickly by the pilot. Certified ADS-B data, which records more accurate latitude and longitude data than the, F, than the DFDR, was provided by the NTSB by the FAA. Analysis of the ADSB and uh, DFDR data show that the airplane touched down about 1,000 feet from the runway threshold and a ground speed of about 158 knots. With about 1,000 feet and 500 feet of runway remaining, the airplane ground speeds were 72 knots and 57 knots respectively. So 72 knots of ground speed at 1,000 feet and 57 knots at just 500 feet remaining. The right turn to exit the runway was initiated at about 39 knots of ground speed and the aircraft departed the end of the paved surface at about 22 knots. Remember, it's generally considered a 10 knot maximum to make a 90 degree turn 
in one of these airliner type aircraft even less so in wet conditions so here it shows the 500 foot remaining uh 56 knots right there at 500 feet 39 knots right here at the numbers and departing at about 23 22 knots right here with the nose wheels skidding off right off the runway and taxiway what are the standard operating procedures for landing on wet or slippery runways use maximum reverse thrust not just idle reverse thrust as soon as possible after main wheel touchdown thrust reversers are most effective at high speeds do not wait for the nose wheel to touch down so you're cleared to open the thrust reversers with the mains down um, some people transitioning from other aircraft like md-80s were more careful about those buckets in the back of the aircraft auto brake stopping determine the required distance to the desired runway exit point and select an auto brake setting of three or max that's what i was getting at it's generally considered in the industry if you're going to land on a wet runway you always set the auto brakes to three or greater if any doubt exists regarding runway condition or braking action available be conservative and use max auto brakes no mention about the the the, the stowing of the spoilers classic case of the swiss cheese model of accident investigation in this captain's initial interview it sounds like he thought that the runway he was landing on was going to be the dry runway and the runway that he elected not to land on was the wet runway but it'll be up to the cockpit voice recorder to determine if that story holds water in the swiss cheese model of accident investigation each layer of swiss cheese represents another barrier and we have barriers in place to to inhibit uh, the chain of events going all the way through the swiss cheese uh, resulting in a kablamo here at the end of the swiss cheese model are you're relying solely on the pilot his knowledge and his flying ability remember the old story in general aviation where i'd rather rely on my good judgment than on my superior flying skills to avoid an accident and and not go <laughs> well in it's a little more complicated in part 121 flying where you've got two pilots working together as a team a pilot flying and a pilot monitoring in safety reports over the years we found that the pilot monitoring captures more mistakes 70 percent more mistakes than does the pilot flying and that makes sense because the pilot flying is all wrapped up in his work flying the aircraft and the pilot monitoring has a bigger picture of what's going on so this is why it'll be very critical in this situation to hear what the cvr has to say what the co-pilot was saying about all of this as things were unfolding <laughs> this is <laughs> Another common thing where when the captain screws up, the co-pilot still goes down with the ship in the investigation because he was supposed to stop or prevent or keep the captain from continuing down this rosy path of destruction. So the first layer of the Swiss cheese model of barriers is standard operating procedures. If you remove these barriers from your standard operating procedures, for example, by stowing the um, spoilers early or reducing the auto brake setting, you are opening yourself up to a direct <laughs> nonstop flight to relying on pilot skills and knowledge to prevent an accident. And this is the last layer that you want to have to rely on. And safety studies have shown that pilots who intentionally disregard the standard operating procedures known as pink or procedural intentional non-compliance with standard operating procedures have twice suffer twice as many errors in their aircraft operation and three times as many undesirable aircraft states in the industry thank you so much for your support of this channel especially the folks over on patreon that make this content possible see you here